Hey guys, I got an incredible war story to tell you today. And I picked this out just for you because it's a very special week. Right now, it is Christmas week. It's going to be Christmas in just a few days. And so I, uh, I came across this war story. And let me tell you a little bit about how I came across it. We, I was doing a, a video about a gun. It was actually a baby Nambu that was carried by a pilot. There was documentation that was carried by a pilot. Uh, you can see a quick picture of this, and this is a separate video. Make sure you watch that one. I was going to combine it with this story because it's a pilot story, a Japanese pilot story, and I, f I figured it was so good that it needed a video all by itself, plus it's Christmas week, and this war story is filled with little Christmas miracles. Now, it is a timeless story, so no matter where, when you're watching it, I, I think it's something you'll remember for a long time. So in the thumbnail, which a lot of people use as clickbait, we uh, have pictures of two men. Uh, one is a Japanese flyer, and he led the attack at Pearl Harbor. And then we have an American flyer who was part of the Doolittle raid. And the story is about these two men, how they became closest of friends. How does that happen? That's our worst story that I want to tell you today. So our story starts with Mitsuo Fushida. Um, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, but he was born in 1902, obviously in Japan, and he went to the Japanese Naval Academy. As a sidelight, he might have been given a baby Nambu. We have no record of the gun that he carried, but we know a lot of the cadets at the uh, uh, Japanese War College and the Naval Academy, many of them were given baby Nambus. So that's where it really started my search on this story, is to find out what kind of gun he carried. And then I, I learned more and more about this guy and I just had to tell you about him. So he, he started off as a flyer in the war in 1939. Uh, he was part of the uh, campaign against China. Uh, and then also throughout Indochina, they uh, attacked the British and Dutch colonies. In the Chinese campaign, he actually distinguished himself as a leader and a flyer. And therefore, he was chosen to lead the raid and Pearl Harbor, the surprise attack at Pearl Harbor. As a matter of fact, uh, he was a prolific writer, and so in leading the raid at Pearl Harbor, he actually kept his notes, and later that was used in the movie Tora Tora Tora. If you watch that movie in the very beginning, it says the, the infamous battle at Pearl Harbor, as told by both the Japanese side and the American side. He did a lot of writing from the Japanese side of what it was like to have attacked Pearl Harbor, and that was used in the movie Tora Tora Tora, and also the movie Pearl Harbor. So here's, here's a few scenes from uh, both Pearl Harbor and Tora Tora Tora, where Fushida is prominently displayed throughout both uh, movies during the attack. <laughs> These movies were actually made from the actual actual facts that he wrote down later. His crew chief uh, is seen here giving him a bandana that read uh, certain victory. And then as he led the attack, attack, there were two other crewmen with him. He was the crew chief. He actually stayed over the target for the first raid. And when the first raid went back, he continued to stay over the target um, and taking notes and stayed until the second wave uh, was done, and then he went back to the ship, which was the aircraft carrier 
Akagi. Those of you who know the movie Torah, 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 those were the infamous words that he used to signal back to the aircraft carrier that the, um, that the attack was a complete surprise and that they, basically they, that part of the campaign was successful in that they, they caught the Americans off guard. And then, of course, from a Japanese perspective, it was a complete victory. As an aside, he actually went back to the ship and drew a diagram of the destruction of the uh, American fleet. Um, and recently, that diagram, shown here, uh, was sold on auction for over $400,000. After leading the attack on Pearl Harbor, Fushida went back to Japan where he was hailed as a hero. Um, he actually got a private audience with the emperor, which is a super big deal. Um, and he was uh, continued in more campaigns throughout China and Indochina. His next big venture was the Battle of Midway. Uh, again, a recent movie, um, but the Battle of Midway was a turning point in the war where he continued to serve with basically the same crew that had uh, bombed Pearl Harbor. Now, most of you know the uh, Battle of Midway went a much different direction in that the uh, United States kind of knew ahead of time that, the, that they were going to uh, attack Midway. An incredible war story about how naval intelligence was able to crack the code and figure out that the Japanese were coming. And they were, so they were ready for them. Our aircraft carriers against their air aircraft carriers. And it was a turning point in the war in that every major battle before Midway uh, was won by the Japanese, and every major battle beyond that was won by the Americans. So it really was. Midway was an island midway in the Pacific, but it was also the mid-turning point of the war. So Fushida was in that battle as well, and he actually recorded, from the, again, from the Japanese side, he took many notes that were used later by American uh, historians. In that battle, he, he missed, he missed the, uh, being able to fly with his crew because of emergency surgery, appendectomy, uh, he, was, he was not able to, to fly. Uh, he, however, was wounded in that battle because a bomb hit uh, his ship, the Kagi, uh, and he was wounded in that battle. Uh, later, it was scuttled by the Japanese because it was so badly damaged, it wasn't going to make it back to the Japan. They knew that the ship would be captured by the Americans, so they scuttled the ship. He was transferred in, to another ship and finally made it back to Japan. So now wounded, Fushida makes it back to Japan where his wounds kind of keep him in an administrative role with uh, the naval hierarchy. Um, and he was stationed, or his hometown was in Hiroshima of all places. And just before the bomb dropped, again, <laughs> a, a, a Christmas miracle, just before the bomb drops, the day before, he's called back to Tokyo for a meeting and uh, the atomic bomb is dropped on Hiroshima. He then uh, joins a crew the day after the bomb is dropped. There's a group of uh, uh, Army and Navy officers who go to see the destruction, trying to figure out what is this new weapon that the Americans have. And so he went with a team of people the day after the explosion, and they toured the city. Uh, he's heartbroken because this, many of his friends and family lived in that city, and that was basically his hometown. Um, so he's heartbroken from the destruction. And just to add insult to injury, the team that he went with, as he writes, as he writes the story later, he said every one of those uh, members of that team died of radiation poisoning within a short period of time, except for him. He actually showed no symptoms at all of radi radiation poisoning, even though he was with the team the day after the bombing. So in 19, obviously uh, August, September of 1945, the war is now over. And Fushida is actually called to come and testify at some of the war crimes trials. Now, in researching this a little bit, uh, what, what was that about? Was he on trial for war crimes? It doesn't seem that he was on trial, but he was more or less forced to come in and testify in the trials because the Americans wanted to go after the hierarchy who ordered the, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Not so much the rank and file, like he was a commander and led the raid, but he's following orders. So from my research, it seems that he was called in to testify to confirm who actually gave the order or who led the attack. And they were, they were doing this as part of their after the war, war crimes trials. Now he was, uh, he, in his own words, he was very much against this. He didn't want to testify. He thought it was a lot of baloney because he, at, at that point, and what he writes is, there was atrocities on both sides. I mean, he, he, he's witnessed Hiroshima, 
Uh, he's seen a lot of destruction, and his point of view was both the Americans and the Japanese did a lot of terrible things during the war. We were equally responsible, and he really deeply resented being called in and being made to uh, testify against his countrymen. It was during the time of these uh, trials, which is actually 1946, he heard about some of the Japanese prisoners coming home. Now, his, his uh, co-pilots, the, the guys that he served with, many of them he thought were dead. But in fact, they were captured, they were shot down and then rescued uh, from the water uh, by the Americans and put in prisoner war camps. So he went to meet his friends. He was, uh, it was a really happy reunion because, again, he thought these guys were dead and he, he sees them. So in these meetings with his fellow pilots, guys that he had served with, and expecting to hear horror stories about how they were treated uh, by the Americans, he in fact hears stories about how the Americans were very kind to them. In fact, they tell a story about a woman named Peggy Covell who actually helped them. She helped, she nursed the wounded, she fed the sick, she made sure they were taken care of, and she told them an incredible story about her own life and told her about a story of love and forgiveness uh, being part of her Christian faith. So allow me to pause this part of the story just for a minute and bring in a little bit of Peggy because she is actually a, a, an American hero in my opinion and a hero of the faith in that um, she grew up in Japan as a Christian missionary. There's a picture of her family uh, in Japan. Uh, they were there and they ministered to the people of Japan before the war. In 1939, things became so bad between Japan and the United States. They're not at war yet, but there's an embargo against Japan because they attacked China. Uh, so they've tr uh, broken trade. Uh, there's a lot of really bad feeling. And so uh, her parents felt like they had to get out of Japan. So in 1939, they fled to the Philippines. Uh, in fact, Peggy uh, graduated from high school at, uh, uh, in, the, in Manila. And then her family, see, again, seeing all the tensions uh, and wanting to, uh, her to go to college, they sent their children to the United States for education, and they stayed in the Philippines. Uh, they actually were stationed in Manila, and as you probably know, within a week of the Pearl Harbor raid, the Japanese invaded the Philippines, and by 1942, they take Manila. Now, her mom and dad then flee to the mountains. They, they go into the jungles with a group of about 100 uh, Christians, uh, Filipino Christians, uh, part of a small church community. Uh, they're, living, they're living in the woods. For, they, they survive for a, a little over a year when the Japanese catch up to them. Uh, they round them all up and uh, sentence them all to death as American spies. Um, the, the Covells, mom and dad, uh, ask for a half an hour uh, to read the Bible and pray. And the Japanese re uh, granted that request and then executed them by beheading. They executed all 100 of the people in that village, including the men, the women, and the children, all of them beheaded. Now, Peggy didn't find out what happened to her family uh, until some time later. And of course, when she heard this story, she was filled with anger toward the Japanese and what they had done. But she qu very quickly realized that her family asking, her mom and dad asking to pray, uh, she knew, she said, she in her own writing says, I know she was praying for the people who executed her because that's what Jesus did before he went to the cross. Uh, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And so because of her, her uh, Christian love, her Christian faith, she volunteers to go to the prisoner of war camp in Utah and minister to the Japanese soldiers. She speaks Japanese. Uh, she preaches to them and helps them, uh, helps the wounded and feeds the sick. Uh, so she ministers to them. And because of that, several of the Japanese captors actually became Christians, go back to Japan, and that's where they run into Fushida. Now, uh, back to Fushida, his reaction to this, and again, this is his own words. It's not my story. This is his story. He's written several books about this story. He said he was just he was obsessed with getting to, like, what in the world? This was mind-blowing to him because he said, I, was, I grew up in a Bushida code, which was you kill your enemies, you never surrender, and if somebody does something to you, like kills your mom and dad, you are obligated to seek revenge against those people. And here he was hearing this story, this counter uh, culture to his, that basically says, love your enemies. 
So he said it just blew his mind. He was obsessed with learning more. What in the world is going on with my friends and these people who have converted to Christianity? So he begins, uh, he begins to seek answers. Now we're going to put a pin in this story again and uh, bring in a third character, which is Jacob de Chaser. Now, he's the, uh, he's the flyer that was pictured in the thumbnail that I already, um, I already mentioned, who was part of the Doolittle Raid. So let's talk a little bit about his life. He, he is also a pilot. Uh, he joined the Air Corps in 1940. So before Pearl Harbor, he joins the Air Corps. He volunteers for the Doolittle Raid. He didn't know what the raid was, but it was a secret mission. And uh, there were several, all, all the men who went on this mission volunteered. He was obviously a very good airman. And he is in the Doolittle Raid, which, uh, those of you who don't know, that was where the uh, B-25 bombers took off from aircraft carriers. They had to take off a little bit early because they realized the Japanese discovered that they were approaching Japan. Um, and so they went ahead and launched, uh, launched the planes about 100, 100 miles uh, further away from Japan than they really wanted to. So the bottom line was uh, many of the, they dropped their bombs but many of them didn't make it. They ended up um, crashing in China. The goal was to get past the Japanese territory. The Japanese had conquered the eastern portion of China, but the western, the, the mid and western portions of China uh, was held by the Chinese, and the Americans' pilots were hoping to make it to the Chinese territory, and many of them did not. This is actually um, not this actual story of Jacob, but this is portrayed in the movie Pearl Harbor. If you remember, uh, I think it's Ben Affleck and Josh Hartnett that are shot down and they end up in the Chinese uh, section. And you can see what happens in terms of uh, one of them being killed and one of them uh, living uh, to the end of the war. But that's what happened to Jacob. He came down in Japanese occupied territory. And as you probably know, the Japanese were incredibly angry about what, they, uh, what the Americans had done. They had not only bombed uh, Tokyo, but Jacob actually, uh, he dropped his bombs on the city of Nagoya, Japan, uh, which was news to me. I thought they only attacked uh, Tokyo, but they attacked some other cities. So he dropped his bombs. He crash lands in China, and two of his crew were executed by firing squad, and then one other of his crew starved to death in the prisoner of war camps. Uh, he was put in solitary confinement, and again, according to his own story, his words were he was tortured and starved and beaten almost daily in solitary confinement for over a year. And during that time, he asked from his guards for a Bible. Uh, they weren't allowed to have any books, but they were allowed to have a Bible. And so he asked for a Bible, which he was given for a period of three weeks. During those three weeks, uh, he read the Bible, and he was particularly impressed where in the Gospels where um, Jesus talks about loving your enemies. And uh, so he, he converted to Christianity. And from that point on, he said he just tried to really love his enemies. And his, according to him, his treatment after that point uh, became better and better. He was rescued from China by American paratroopers who came in and freed the prisoners of war. He came back to the United States where he became a, uh, he decided to be a, a preacher and later went to Japan to the city of Nagoya and uh, started a church among the Japanese people. All right, well, we're full of Christmas miracles here, but let's go back to Fushida and find out what happens to him. He's in a second war crime trial. After the first war crime trial, he, that's where he first heard about uh, Peggy Covell. And then uh, sometime later, it seems like it was several months later, he was part of another war crimes trial and brought in to testify. And he, he mentions that he's going to the courthouse. So right somewhere in the city, on the steps of the courthouse, somebody is handing out Christian tracts. Uh, basically, these are pamphlets, which would be testimonials. And in this particular one was the story of Jacob de Chaser. And so, of course, he was... He had already been, had his mind blown by the life of Peggy and what she had done. And now he's reading this story about this guy who was uh, beaten and tortured in a Japanese prisoner war camp. And now he's preaching the gospel. And he's, he's read, reads the story, goes back and um, begins to read the Bible for himself. And long story short, he converts to Christianity. He then goes back to the United States because he wants to meet Jacob. And as he tells the story, he goes to Jacob's house, knocks on the door and says, Sir, 
I've been wanting to meet you. And they become lifelong friends from that point on. So to uh, wrap up this war story slash Christmas uh, miracle story, um, they become close friends and uh, Fushida and Jacob de Chazar end up traveling together around the United States and also in Japan, uh, where Jacob ends up as a missionary for 30 years. Uh, he, li he lives to the ripe old age of 97, by the way, he died in 2008. And um, Fushida uh, actually traveled with Billy Graham for a while, gave his testimony in Billy Graham Crusades. And doing the research to this story, it reminded me that I heard this story once before as a young boy. Uh, I think my father was watching Billy Graham on TV and heard this testimonial, a, a story I long forgot until I began to research it for this video. So in summary, this war story is about the man who led the attack on Pearl Harbor, who converted to Christianity, moved to the United States, and preached a message of love and forgiveness. And Hey guys, it doesn't get any better than that. Merry Christmas.